Dear friends, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we've never really believed that our children are just run-of-the-mill, ordinary kids. There's something unique about them. They're more than just ordinary, not just because they're Hornemans or some other last name, but they are significant, and, and Jackson is very significant. That's why we put the mark of Jesus Christ on him. He was born not just of some biological process, but we believe he was born of God. We believe that he's part of something that's bigger and higher and deeper than any effort and that he carries a mark that's more significant than any tattoo or pierced body part or whatever. Even though maybe not terribly visible at first, later on in life, we trust that we'll begin to see the mark of who he is. Now you will find this special something about all of us as men, women, and children bonded with the Lord. There's something that raises us who are marked with the love of Christ beyond the ordinary. Something that goes further than maybe what the eye can see at first or the mind can even fully understand. There is, you see, this divine rootedness about us that goes beyond this shallow existence. And this beyond the ordinary kingdom trait makes it possible for little folks like Jackson and all of us to set our hearts on the kind of excellence and integrity of life that reflects something of God himself. Now David, the fellow we read about this morning, The promise of this quality was in his life. Now at first when you read the story, it sounds so terribly ordinary. A long-standing feud between Saul and David, what else is new? Saul would have liked to see David destroyed. What else is new? He was his competitor. He was a serious contender. And better than Saul himself, he was the emerging leader, and Saul felt threatened. He tried to chase him down more than once, and each attempt was foiled. Nothing terribly unordinary about that, except, except that David doesn't Take the usual ordinary steps. In spite of the ill feelings between Saul and David, David doesn't do what you might expect him to do. And it all starts with this Amalekite. Thinking that everything was quite ordinary throughout, and that he could gain, he could gain from this hostility between David and Saul. A political insight, quite ordinary. He thought he could enjoy the favor of David by telling him that he had ended Saul's life for him. His opponent was eliminated. David should be quite happy. Now, if all things had gone as usual, David would have been very happy and satisfied about the Amalekite's deed for his benefit. After all, Saul was not exactly David's best friend. Several attempts had been made on David's life, and now the opposition was out of the way, and the way was clear for David to take control. 
Now you have to credit this Amalekite for using this difficult relationship between Saul and David for his advantage. David had just finished defeating the Amalekites in a battle a short time before, and at least this fellow's life would now possibly be spared for finishing him off. David's antagonist. Now, being an ordinary sort of fellow, the Amalekite likely fabricated the whole story, made it up about taking Saul's life. Because it conflicts with what we read in 1 Samuel. And there Paul or Saul is described as taking his own life. That's more likely the way it happened. After losing the battle with the Philistines, Saul impales himself on a spear, rather committing suicide than being killed by the enemy, which was a worse dishonor. So then comes along this Amalekite, this scavenger of the spoils of war, and instead of the opportunity for taking the spoils of war, he figures, why don't I just go back to David and tell him that I killed him? But the Amalekite made a serious error. He thought David was simply like all the rest. He figured on this potential leader as a rather ordinary specimen of humanity who would simply be interested in his own interest, his own future, his own personal power, and the opportunity for revenge. The Amalekite hadn't picked up on this extraordinary stuff that David was made of. And David did not respond typically. In fact, the Amalekite must have received the surprise of his life at David's reaction. You see, David, when he heard, mourned. His men tore their clothes, wept, fasted until evening, much to the Amalekite's chagrin, David was not supposed to do that. All things being ordinary, he should have been delighted at the news. And instead, David takes up a lament and writes a eulogy for Saul and Jonathan and the army of the Lord. And, and the Amalekite, in turn, is the one that is killed for a murder which he didn't even do but try to get the credit for. One would expect David to be upset about the death of Jonathan. After all, Jonathan was his best friend. You mourn for the death of your best friends and you give a eulogy. But David, David does more than that. He rises above simply personal relationships. He includes Saul, his opponent, in his grieving. Strange, beyond the ordinary. And this twist of unexpected events happens the way it does because David operates beyond the ordinary. He's the very stuff of which God's kingdom is built. He became the prominent leader of his people Israel because of that. And David has introduced us to us here as the one who is bonded with God above all the other relationships. And he's committed to a mission that overrides any other motive or ambition, his own or someone else's. David's sight line is on what God is doing in the world. And the Lord wants to do it with his people, and Saul was part of it, whether David liked him or not. 
And even though Saul wasn't the friendliest guy in the world, he was still, he was still in a fractured, imperfect, broken way, part of this grand scheme as David was. Even though from Saul's point of view, they were on opposite sides, Saul and David were fundamentally on the same team. David still recognizes him as the anointed of the Lord. Notice how that little phrase comes up. That Saul, in spite of everything, was still the anointed of the Lord. David didn't think much of him. And I don't think God thought much of him. In fact, he was getting him out of the way. But just the same... Saul, regardless, was at that time the Lord's representative. And as such, David saw him as that. And he treated Saul that way. So David was able to rise above the expected ordinary feelings of relief and hostility and political intrigue and conflict. When he heard of Saul's death, he mourned. He mourned the loss of a man who had been part of God's work in the world. David was able to remain focused on what this was really all about. But those of us who know a little more about David realize he wasn't such a great fellow either. He has some very major flaws with which today's standards would put him behind bars, probably. And some of them eventually became part of his downfall himself. Because you see, David, David could never be that perfect representative of this more than ordinary people. The day was still to come when someone Someone who was completely, who completely embodied this beyond the ordinary stuff of the kingdom would be able to see it through to what it needed to be. Yes, David as a whole did represent life in this extraordinary way in partnership with God in spite of faltering on many scores and on many occasions. As you might expect, this greatness, this greatness of a walk with God which lifts human life to new heights, doesn't end with David. It was actually just a preliminary taste of it. A taste of what God was up to. Someone would come along who was even greater. We follow him today. He is that most extraordinary person. The son of God himself. Heaven on earth in the person of Jesus. Starting out in an ordinary way. In a town of Bethlehem. Raised in Nazareth. Suffering the ordinary things of life that all people suffer. And yet through it all representing the very power and strength of God on earth and leaving all personal inclinations behind and personal agendas and his own personal well-being. He blazed a trail consistently that still mystifies the human mind today, representing something fully and completely that had not been experienced before this time even offering his own life, his own life for the higher cause, the extraordinary cause, the restoration of all things. And by now, you might wonder a little bit how we got from Jackson to David. Well, you see, it's about the same thing. The same power of God with which he was marked today, 
that runs through the centuries of time, culminating in Jesus Christ, who fills our lives and who did it so well, extraordinarily, beyond the ordinary. The very transforming presence of God, binding us to himself so that we can share in this life beyond the ordinary. We become part of something that's bigger and brighter and wider and deeper than any worldly imitation. So much so that it overcomes all things. And it's this power of God, God's presence, that enabled David to rise above the expected, ordinary moment. It's what brought Christ into the world to tackle the darkness of the day and the darkness of the ordinary human life. And today we see men, women, and children who begin to share in that extraordinary life of things to come. There's one message that needs to get across to our youngsters time and again. That they are unique. Not just because they're human beings. Not because they're attractive or intelligent or of special needs. They are unique and significant because they are part of this more than ordinary people created and shaped and reshaped and moved along by the presence of God. They are people restored to his way of excellence. And if we can just get that message across in our words, in our modeling and remembering our baptism, that dynamic of life in God and with God, a life of healing and wholeness will begin to sweep through our children in our lives. Our cities and our neighborhoods will continue to be populated with some people that will continue to do what is really quite usual. The cracks in their outwardly respectable lives will continue to show. They will be swamped by the troubles of the day. There will be very few surprises that way. Human relationships will continue to deteriorate. Integrity and faithfulness and trust will be out of reach. Even at political levels and church levels. But in people from generation to generation, there is this extraordinary strain, this stream of people in whom Christ lives Predominantly and completely. A people who are the very embodiment of everything we were meant to be and where the Lord is taking history. Surely, it will take an extraordinary, an extraordinary movement of God with which we want to identify and continue to mark our lives. We will want to give ourselves to him in, in, in completely dedicated people in whom God's spirit, the spirit of Christ grows. And we'll make sure that our children catch it and see it and experience it in us as parents and as a community of faith. God bless you in that wonderful endeavor of being part of that movement of God in the world. Amen. Dear Lord, you've done your part, a huge part. You've marked us with the love of Christ. It represents that beginning of a new world restoration of life and a new future. And Lord, you know even better than we do how 
Badly we need that in our culture and in our world today. And we thank you that you've distinguished us to significance, to be part of that, to reflect it, to be a continuing taste of it. Bless your church, bless our families, as we seek to do that for you and for each other. Living that extraordinary life, a full life in you. Amen. Amazing love. <laughs>